Um, I'm just curious, we're going to be having a, one of the living lights of the education field with us in just a moment. Would anybody who is an educator or a student stand up, please? Whoa. <laughs> Well, we really want to honor you. Thank you for doing what you do and for being here today. The 2005 Environmental Literacy in America report by the National Environmental Education Foundation cited the quiz that it gives to the American public and found that out of 10 questions, people got 2.2 answers correct in questions about the environment, and random guessing would produce 2.5 correct answers. <laughs> And what the report goes on to say is that the, these low figures are especially important because knowledge is linked to behavior. What a concept. <laughs> this environmental knowledge deficit cuts across all levels of society. And given the imperative to transform environmental behavior on a mass scale, how do we educate 7 billion people really fast? and the knowledge that it's often, that knowledge is linked to behavior, education is absolutely imperative. And as H.G. Wells, the futurist from a century ago and science fiction writer said, we're in a race between education and catastrophe. And as David Orr, the, one of the leading environmental educators in the country puts it, institutions of higher learning, indeed all schools, must aim to create an ecologically literate and ecologically competent citizenry one that knows how the earth works as a physical system and why that knowledge is vitally important to them personally and to the larger human prospect. Environmental education must be an exercise in applied hope. Today, environmental education programs exist on about half of American campuses, which is actually a very significant increase from about 30 years ago. Environmental studies is picking up steam as the hot major, and it's increasingly a key criterion for students in their choice of an institution. But there's lots more to this picture. The movement to green campuses is flowering. Students, faculty, and administration are combining teaching and research with real-world practice on campus to make change. Climate change has motivated numerous higher educational institutions to take a much greater leadership role, not only within their institutions, but in society. And what we're also witnessing is the gold ring of education's leadership role is the dawning trend among colleges and universities to create town-gown partnerships to actually work to restore their own communities, such as what David Orr is now doing in Oberlin, for the town and the, um, and the college to partner to go carbon neutral by 2020, create a 20,000 20, acre, excuse me, agriculture and forestry belt, and an entire green downtown redevelopment. <laughs> if even a large fraction of the 4,100 colleges and universities in the country emulate this model, that's a game changer. Um, Tony Cortese is a game changer in higher education. As one of the nation's pathfinding leaders in greening higher education, his writings on education for sustainability serve as foundational reading for transforming the process and content of higher education. Tony has played a primary role in the creation of nearly, nearly all the key national organizations working to transform higher education. Um, he's the president and co-founder of Second Nature, the highly effective nonprofit working to make healthy, just, and sustainable action a first principle of higher education. He's the principal organizer for the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, which now has, I believe, over 700 schools signed up and college presidents in all 50 states, representing 6 million students, which is about a third of the U.S. higher education student population. And he's the co-founder of the groundbreaking Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education and of the Higher Education Association's Sustainability Consortium. Tony advises individual universities, businesses, and nonprofits on how to institutionalize their sustainability principles and programs. For over 20 years, he's been deeply influential well beyond the world of education on climate change and other large-scale sustainability challenges in the worlds of both business and governance. He very bravely served as the commissioner of Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. He was a founding member of the board of the Natural Step US and the Environmental Business Council of New England. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science 
has been a consultant to the UN Environment Program and is a board and is a member of the EPA's Science Advisory Board. If the 21st century goes down in history as the turning point of ecological awakening and transformation, the leaders of that transformation will likely have been nurtured in institutions that were profoundly influenced and shaped by the master of applied hope, Dr. Anthony Cortese. Thank you and good morning. I want, I'm here to talk to you about three things today. One is a radically different and better means of meeting the needs of all current and future humans on this planet. A second is what college, higher education is doing and needs to do in order to make this transformation occur. And third, what you can do to push this movement. Humanity is at a crossroads without precedent. For the first time in history, we have our planetary force. We have, the, we have the force of the asteroids and the ice ages in redirecting Earth's history. In the last two centuries, we've grown in population from 1 billion to 6.7 billion today. Energy consumption has gone up 80 times. Economic growth has gone up 68 times. And most of that has happened in my lifetime. All living systems are in long-term decline. We have, uh, we have 3.2 billion people who are without sanitation and make less than $2.50 a day. Global climate change will disrupt the capacity of the Earth to have a modern civilization. Now, this is all happening with 25% of the world's population consuming 70 to 80% of the world's resources. China and India are appropriately trying to raise the quality of life for all the majority of their population. As they said in Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem. The central question for humanity is this. How will we assure that all current and future humans will have their basic needs met, a decent quality of life, on a, on a world that will have 9 billion people by the year 2050, and aims to increase economic output by four to five times during that period. That is the central question for humanity. And what I want to talk to you about is not about saving the planet, but it's really the greatest civilizational, moral, and intellectual challenge humans have ever had. It's about figuring out how we can preserve the capacity of the Earth's life support system to support all of us now and in the future to have a decent quality of life. How did we get here? Well, humans have always, we've always exploited the Earth. Uh, we're dominated by short-term, linear thinking. We are we based, modern industrial societies based on the idea that economic growth and consumption is the goal, the primary goal, of individual and societal su success. We, we assume that humans are separate from the Earth and that we are the dominant species. Anything we do to the Earth is by definition good. We also assume that the Earth will be the gift that keeps on giving ad infinitum, ad infinitum, and irrespective of the size of the population and our material desires. And we also are base, the, base our ideas on the, on the idea that technology, technology, human technology will solve all problems. Unfortunately, 
Higher education is actually reinforcing the unhealthy, inequitable, and unsustainable path that we are on. Now, this is not intentional. It's based on the, the idea that, um, it's based on the idea that, that of all those assumptions I was just talking about. They're so deeply embedded that they are hidden cultural assumptions. That's what a cultural assumption is all about. It's so deeply hidden that we never discuss it. And it's all based on the idea that we think that the best way to learn about things is to learn thing in silos, things in silos. You know, in the Judeo-Christian uh, story of the creation of the earth, God created the heaven and earth in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. I'm here to tell you that that is not true. First, he or she created the physics department, the chemistry department, the biology department, the political science department, engineering, and they act as if they will still be here when the world is gone. So, we need a change in mindset. And that change in mindset has to be around the notion that we need to create a healthy, just, and sustainable society as the core goal of society. Einstein once said, famously said, we can't solve today's problems at the level of thinking at which they were created. You know what they say in AA, one definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So the mindset change has to begin with education. So now join me. Join me for a moment. On a journey of hope and possibility. What do we know about living sustainably on the Earth? Well, first, that we would use as little energy and resources as possible. And that we would run society on renewable energy. Secondly, we know that we should be running our industrial economy change it from a linear take-make waste to a circular production economy in which we eliminate the concept of waste because all waste products or raw materials are nutrients for a new industrial activity, just like nature does. Eliminate the concept of waste. So imagine my laptop computer, when it's done, I can take it back to a company and they can remake it into another computer not take more resources out of the ground. The third principle is that we would only use natural resources at the rate at which they can self-regenerate. These are the ideas embodied in sustainable agriculture, sustainable forestry, sustainable fishing. We would live off nature's income, not its capital, as we're currently doing. These are the principles of biomimicry, learning from and imitating nature. And what we need to do is make the modern industrial society mimic nature, biomimetic principles. We're going to have to do something else. This shift, this new sto human story, has to be based, is based as much on values and culture as it is in science and technology. If this was just a scientific and technological problem, it would have been solved. I'm a scientist and an engineer, and I'm telling you, if I could solve this problem for everybody on the Earth right now, I'd be a very happy person. But this is more about the arts and sciences, the social and behavioral sciences. It's about religion and spirituality to help us rise above consumption and to put the community of people and the community of species on the earth as the center of making us all be individually successful. That's the transformation. Now, how do we do this? How do we make this kind of thinking second nature in higher education? Well, higher education is critical. We train all the future, 
a la carte in all the future professionals in every area of society, including the K-12 teachers. We train the people in business, in government, all the leaders in society. We also produce the research that is the basis for a modern civilization. Without higher education, we wouldn't be here today. I certainly would not. And it's enormous. And higher education must lead this transformation. So what would it look like if higher education were aligned with producing the graduates and the knowledge and operating as a model for the rest of society connected to the sustainability principles? Well, first, the content and the context of learning would be such that the human environment interdependence, values and ethics, and system, systems thinking would be a seamless part of the learning of every student, no matter what their major is. There is no other way to do this. Specialists like me will not solve the world's problems. We need to make sure that everybody understands their, their place, how the world works, how the, the, the natural world works, and how we can fit in and thrive. The second thing is that the process of education needs to change so that experiential, active experiential, inquiry-based, problem-solving and learning based on helping the campus and the community to be sustainable is an important part of the future of education. Here's what the educational psychologists tell us. In the long run, we retain 20% of what we read or hear and 80% of what we do. And that's exactly why being able to make this part of the whole educational experience is critical. Higher education would walk the talk. You know, higher education institutions are like mini cities. Sometimes they're big cities. You take Arizona State University with 70,000 students, that, and, and about 10 to 15,000 employees, 20,000 employees, excuse me. They are bigger than most medium-sized U.S. cities. So they're a microcosm of the rest of society. And how we operate, and connecting that to the curriculum and the educational experience, speaks volumes about the kind of behavior that we want, and provide students with the practical knowledge and skills to go out and use this in, in the larger society. And the final thing we would do is to actually have a partnership with local, communi local communities to make them socially, economically, and environmentally sustainable as a central goal of our mission. Now, higher education is a big economic engine. Our annual operating budget is about $350 billion a year. That's greater than, the, greater than the GDP of all but 31 countries in the world. Think about that. Think about the power of that in terms of influencing the market if we are behaving in an environmentally and responsible way. The great news, of course, is what's happening on college campuses. And let me tell you a little bit about that. There has been an explosion of, of actions on college campuses in the last decade. It's incredible. It's the only area of society where we want exponential growth. We don't want exponential growth in population or consumption of resources or the production of pollution and waste. But exponential growth on education and action to make the world a better place that's fantastic. And as Kenny was saying earlier, it's unbelievable what's going on. And, you know, the, we have new majors and minors in environmental and sustainability uh, uh, dimensions in just about every area. The arts and the sciences, in public health, in engineering, in law, in medicine, you name it, agriculture, it's all there. What's Incredible, if you think about, uh, here's another interesting um, part of the story. 
Community colleges, which by the way, have 46% of the 18 million students that are in uh, higher education today, they are leading all of higher education in training the existing and the future workforce for a clean and green economy. They're not debating on whether or not we should do this and whether or not this is just another, fit, not another fad, as happens in some four-year colleges and universities. They're doing it. They're out there doing it. And the, which we might call the greening of campuses. I don't like that term. It's really, it's about sustainable, sustainability practices on college campuses. That's where college campuses are leading. If you can imagine any way that we can be more healthy and socially responsible and environmentally responsible, it's being tried on some college campus in the United States. It's unbelievable. We are leaders in just about every, in many areas. For example, according to the US Green Building Council, higher education has more buildings that are certified for sustainable design, 4,000 in the last five years, than any other sector in society. This is incredible. The student environmental movement is the most well-organized and sophisticated movement on college campuses since the civil rights and the anti-war movement of the 1960s. They are driving the change. You are driving the change. Unfortunately, however, We are not doing a very good job on the economic, social, and health dimensions of sustainability. We're still looking at this as, as an environmental issue when it's not. If there's anything that you can take away from what I'm telling you today is that this is not an environmental issue alone. It's about how do we make, remake the human presence on this finite planet in a way that all of us can be healthy and have our needs met, have economic opportunity, and future generations will have their opportunity as well. Now, with all the wonderful things that are going on in college campuses, most of them have not been systemic kinds of changes. But there is a beacon of hope. And that is the American College and University President's Climate Commitment. In February of 2007, Second Nature got together with 12 college and university presidents, ASHE, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, and Eco America to launch this initiative. It is a high level, highly visible, joint and individual commitment by colleges and universities to measure all the greenhouse gases on the campuses, to try to reduce and eventually eliminate them, and to ensure that all the students will graduate having the knowledge and skills to help society do the same. As of today, as Kenny said, we have just under 700 colleges and universities in all 50 states and the District of Columbia, and we have minority-serving institutions, as well as community colleges, as well as four-year baccalaureate colleges, private and public, and the biggest research universities in the United States, Ohio State University and Arizona State University. This is unprecedented leadership by higher education. Higher education is the first and only sector in U.S. society that, that has a large percentage of its, of its, um, of its members committed to becoming climate neutral. Government hasn't done that, as you may have noticed. <laughs> Business hasn't done it. No other sector has done it. This is huge, and it's unprecedented. The college and university presidents that have made this commitment are doing what's scientifically necessary, not what's easily doable. They know this is hard. In many cases, we can't get there. But they're saying because it's urgent and because it is about the future of humanity, we need to lead. And that 
is unprecedented leadership by higher education since World War II. They're not waiting for somebody else to give them the money first to decide to do it. They're saying, we need to do this, and we're going to find a way to do that. And that is, from my perspective, incredible. Now, the, the exciting thing is that so far, in less than uh, three years and eight months later, 340 of the campuses have submitted their climate action plans. And what's interesting about all of this is, sure, they can make a commitment, but they have to make their plans and their, and their emissions, um, emissions inventory and their progress publicly available. This is important. That's the meat in this, in this commitment. They are committing to each other that they are going to report publicly on their progress. So what can you do about this? Because this is drop in the bucket. You know, it would be terrific if we could get all colleges and universities to do this, but that's not enough. So what can you do? If you're a high school or a college student, please stand up. Keep standing. Here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to ask, if you are a college student, ask your president if they've made a, signed the president's climate commitment. If they haven't, ask them to do so. If they have, I want you to go back and thank them. You know, people in leadership positions sometimes take very big risks, and we never say thank you. And if you want to reinforce this kind of uh, big decision, then we need to say thank you. If you are a high school student, when you're searching for colleges and universities, look for colleges and universities that are committed to helping you make a more sustainable society. And a lot of the, the, the college information guides that are out there are now beginning to focus on that. So thank you. If you're a faculty member at a college or university, please stand up, or a K through 12 teacher. future in helping the students make this transformation. So here's what I ask you to do. Go to your administrators, or go to the schools of education, or work with the associations like the National Science Te Teachers Associations and others, and ask them all to provide the time and the resources so that you can begin to understand different and better ways of teaching that will result in a healthy, just, and sustainable society. Don't be timid. You need to ask. And we need you because if it isn't for you, I don't know how we can get there. You are among the smartest, most talented, and most committed people in society. And we need you to be well supported to make that happen. Thank you. Many in society have said, and, many, and all the rest of you, I don't have time to be able to ask you specific things. But you know, you have an idea what you can do if you're in the private sector. Start talking to the colleges and universities and ensure that, they, that the graduates, your future workforce, will have the knowledge and skills that will lead to make you a sustainable business. We need to do that in every field. Some people say that getting to climate neutrality or creating a sustainable society is too hard. It's too difficult. It's impractical. People say to us that the president's climate commitment is impractical. You know what? What we have to do is making, make the seemingly impossible and impractical, impractical inevitable. Yeah. 
Growing up in the 60s, I followed the call of John Kennedy to public service because I thought it was the highest calling. And remember what he did. He said that we needed to get to the moon in a decade because it was an important issue for the survival of the United States. No one believed we could get there. They didn't believe it. In fact, there were lots of people in the scientific and engineering community who said it couldn't be done. But because he made it a national goal, and because he was able to get this public support and get the economic support and engage the scientists and engineers, we got to the, to the moon in less than a decade. That's what we need to do for a sustainable society. Benjamin Mays, the former president of Morehouse College and advisor to Martin Luther King, said, the tragedy in life is not in achieving a goal. The tragedy in life is not having a goal. What we need is a goal for higher education to lead us down a healthy, just, and sustainable path. The goal of higher education needs to be to create a thriving and civil and sustainable society now and in the future. Thank you very much.